Okay, good on that. All right. Uh, Charlie Henley in the building architecture design community in Newfoundland Labrador needs no introduction. Uh, he's uh, recently there's been a bit of a corporate reorganization and uh, they're now Stantec Architecture is, is now part of Stantec uh, building on a base of a long-standing successful Newfoundland firm that Charlie was part of. He's practice principal which I guess you're still practicing someday you'll get it right you get that a lot. Uh, Charlie uh, will say a little bit more about uh, where he's coming from in architecture and design and planning for cities. And, uh, but I do recall one of my earliest public policy recollections is a, a, an odd uh, organization or effort in St. John's that was called the Great Fire Foundation. And Charlie, early, as soon as he was out of university, uh, originated that, uh, that effort. So I think we're still living in the reverberations of Charlie's vision. And maybe uh, after we've had, this is the fourth of uh, a series of synergy sessions that we've had tying into the Dalhousie students visiting and leading up to the Festival of Architecture. So I'm really looking forward to Charlie's presentation. As I say, he'll present and then we'll open up to the fo floor for Q&A. And we'll also be able to take questions from our colleagues who are viewing over the internet. Um, is that the meeting you thought you were coming to? Any questions, comments? John, everything covered? Okay, Charlie, floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, and uh, it's, oh. uh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I graduated in 1982. Oh, Neil, you're here, good. Um, uh, from, uh, um, was tons now Dalhousie School of Architecture and uh, I'm still, uh, still practicing architecture. We never ever get it right. My wife was in pharmaceutical sales for years and I used to find myself with some doctors and stuff and I'd say, oh yeah, we're part of the classic professions, engineers, doctors, lawyers, architects. And um, you know, we're to uphold the, the public uh, health and stuff and safety. And I said, you know, I'm still practicing and so are you, but I don't want you to be while I'm lying on, 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 the, on the gurney and uh, you lean over and say, it's my fifth gallbladder operation and I'm getting better. Uh, but uh, in 1980, <coughs> um, 1982, uh, when I uh, graduated, we were very idealistic. And one of the issues that I saw in, in, in St. John's was that there was a lot of controversy over development, particularly in the downtown. And um, we created something called the Great Fire Festival. And I'll get into that uh, fire foundation, the Great Fire Festival. Uh, the talk that I'm going to give is uh, really about that, about the early years, uh, early years of development at St. John's and what caused a lot of the controversy. Uh, about what I saw was an issue and some of my friends saw as an issue that there wasn't enough community participation in, in, in urban related issues in, in how you go about uh, uh, creating uh, what's the best uh, plan of attack or, or vision for the city. Um, so just some observations on practice, what some of the challenges and the drivers and the disconnects are. Um, and then creating a vision, not that we have any answers to that, but that, that really is what we need in order for everybody to get around and, uh, uh, and, and sort of work towards. And then also, uh, just to give this as an introduction into the, um, uh, faculty, the, the, the Festival of Architecture that's here uh, this week and the fact that the students are, are here and making a presentation on Wednesday. So one of the big issues that uh, we had in St. John's uh, is what, uh, you know, people call it progress, some people call it a step backwards, but was the real issue of all of these big, tall, high-rise buildings going up in the downtown of St. John's and really, really blocking off the harbor from, from everybody else uh, up the hill. And, and it caused a tremendous amount of controversy. Uh, there was a lot of furor in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you had um, uh, the Royal Trust Building, uh, which is the white one here that was uh, built in 1969. Atlantic Place, uh, which was built in 1974. And it actually had a proposal for another 13 stories to go on top of the seven, seven or eight stories that are there. Uh, and this was the one that really galvanized a lot of people around uh, um, uh, acti being active against uh, development in the downtown or this type of development in the downtown. 
Uh, and then you have the Toronto Dominion Building, uh, which is this other one here uh, in the background, and you get also the uh, Scotia Center in 1986. So in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of pressure uh, with a certain growth in the, in the economy uh, towards this, and there was a lot of uh, controversy around it. We kind of looked at the, the idea of the Great Fire Foundation was a nonprofit organization that myself and a friend, Wade Kearley, uh, set up. And um, th th just a little bit of history, St. John's burnt down uh, three times, just like many other great cities, Rome, Chicago. Um, and uh, uh, 1817 was the first one, which the city was much smaller then. 1846 and 1892 was the last one. And in 1892, there was about 11,000 people went homeless in about 24 hours uh, when the fire ravaged through the downtown. And, and our idea was to create something about what do you do, what happens next. So, you know, what if St. John's burnt down today? This is what we asked ourselves in 1983, a conversation, you know. What, what would we rebuild? If we had a completely clean slate, how would we go about doing this? Uh, you know, what would that vision be? What would be the phoenix rising out of the fire that we would, we would see that would, that would change things? What, can we, what do we know today that we would be able to bring to bear on the process? Uh, and that was, you know, and we, we felt that there was a need for more uh, community uh, participation, more, more vocal, uh, vocalism from people to get, get activated. <coughs> and then one of the things we realized that there was a lot of, uh, as is interesting, with this particular uh, uh, event that we're on right now, there's a lot of partners make up a collective. When we were there, the Resource Center for the Arts, the Newfoundland Individual Film Cooperative, uh, the Newfoundland Association of Architects, uh, the City of St. John's were very supportive, uh, uh, the Downtown Development Commission, a whole bunch of committed, citi commi committed citizens and business people were, got involved. Um, and then what we were trying to do was come up with a means to try to get the conversation going, which is very similar to what, what we're doing here today. Um, and so we had a whole bunch of things. So we figured we'd create a festival. And we thought that was a very celebratory way of getting people involved to try to break down the idea of the controversy or the shouting matches at, at, at public meetings and at council meetings and stuff. And so we had a, a, a series of uh, 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 things that we did. Um, we had a... a oops, we had a walking tour uh, that we did of downtown St. John's. This bottom picture down here shows the three fires. So obviously St. John's was much smaller. The outside, the inner ring there is uh, 1817, uh, 1846, and 1892, which was this one here. And so what we had was a walking tour that went around the perimeter of the fire. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Rick Boland, but there's a very young Rick Boland back in the early 80s. Um, so we also had lectures. We had Frank Palermo from, uh, we had uh, um, Paul O'Neill who wrote the history book on the history of St. John's, gave a lecture on the history of St. John's. Shane O'Day who had done a fair amount of research on architectural uh, and historical history, talked about you know, uh, things that were rebuilt after the fire and some of the reasons and, and, and rationale as to that. Uh, and Frank Palermo who was a uh, professor of architecture and planning at uh, uh, now, now Dalhousie was tons at the time, uh, came in and talked about you know, what makes a great city and how, how in his opinion, things that we could be doing in order, in order to uh, improve on things. Um, we also had film nights. I know NIFCO now has a film night that they run in the summertime projected on a building, so we had some outdoor uh, film night things. Uh, we had a theater piece. We worked with the Resource Center for the Arts. And this was a walkabout theater piece where you basically went to the LCU Hall and they gave you, uh, you were broken up into four groups. Uh, you were given a button of a color and then you followed with your group and you went to different places in the downtown, different houses, outdoors, indoors, in, in businesses and stuff. And there were scenes of the, of the, of the theater piece were actually uh, done that way and it was about the theme of urban development in the city. Uh, we also uh, reenacted the tent city. Bannerman Park was a tent city after the fire where everybody... Uh, slept in army tents for a number of, number of uh, months and, and almost a year before they um, got into uh, uh, rebuilt uh, houses and stuff. Uh, and there's a very young Robert Mellon uh, who was also involved at the time. Um, we also looked at um, um, one of the things was that the Great Fire, the last Great Fire, was it started up around where Leo's Fish and Chips is. Uh, across the street there was a, almost like... Um, 
um, um, Mrs. Murphy's cow, right, that kicked over the lantern in Chicago. There was a worker smoking a pipe, uh, knocked his ash out of it in the, in, the, in the burn, and it caught fire. It just so happened that that day, down on Rollins Cross, they were, the city were, were uh, repairing the waterworks, uh, and all the water had drained out of the firefighting system, all, all the piping, and it hadn't reached up to that point at that time. There was, as most of you really know, this is a very, very windy place. And, uh, and so there was a strong southwesterly wind blowing. And you can see by the outline of the red, that's, that's what got consumed, uh, mostly wood frame uh, buildings. So the, the western limit of the fire actually comes down Carter's Hill and right down to Beck's Cove at the harbor. And this is the old sewage pumping station uh, that used to be down there. Uh, it's now torn down, and there's a new pumping station there. Um, but the, the idea of this mural is that the, the corner of the building is the center line of the street. And so everything on the left-hand side, <coughs> which is indicated by the steeply pitched roof, because in 1846 there was no industrial revolution, there was no uh, bitumen, there was no asphalt impregnated papers, everything was either a slate or a wood roof that was really, really steep. So you'll see all of the Murray premises and all the buildings that are down there are all 1846. Uh, and everything on to the uh, east of uh, Beck's Cove is all 1892 buildings, which is, which is uh, defined by all the flat roofs because it's a lot cheaper to build a flat roof than it is a steep roof. It lets people fall off them during construction. Uh, it, it, and so that really defines it. So what we did was we wanted to sort of define this, uh, this mural where everything, here, everything on this side is burnt down and everything here is the 1846 uh, uh, buildings. Um, like anything, it, uh, it, all good things come to pass. I got busy as, a, as, a, as an architect, uh, self-employed since 1983, 84. Uh, we were doing this all on a volunteer basis. Funding was limited. My time was limited. And it just got to the point where we said, look, this is, we're just spreading ourselves way too thin. And it, and it got snuffed out uh, uh, after, after we did the 100th anniversary in uh, 1992. But it went on for about six or seven years. But there, there just wasn't enough take up in it to forget it to work. Uh, so that's kind of where, where things got going. The next part I'm going to talk about, just some urban ideas. Um, <clears throat> and and what I'm, I'll get back to this, this idea of this thing uh, slowing down and where we are today a little later on. Um, there's a bunch of things in St. John's that I think we can look at as examples, indigenous examples of things that we, can, we, we really uh, can take advantage of. Uh, there's a, there's a shape of, the, of, the, of how, the, the, particularly the downtown and various other places, and how they developed as a courtyard quadrangle idea. Um, infill housing was a tremendous thing in the downtown um, when, it, when, it, when it happened. Um, the city uh, started up a nonprofit housing um, um, in order to provide housing for people uh, that were needy. Uh, this is a step above public housing, but also Newfoundland and Labrador housing provided public housing. So a lot of the, what happened in the 70s and, and the 80s was that the downtown became a really hot place to want to work you could, er, and live. And you could go in and you could pick up houses like really cheap, like 40,000, 50,000 bucks for some of these, you know, three and four, uh, 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 2,500, 3,000 square foot houses with a view out the window of the Narrows when there weren't any buildings in the way. Um, and, and, and it became, there was a lot of gentrification taking place. But you had a lot of derelict houses that were right next door. So what, this, what was happening was that the city and, and Newfoundland Labrador Housing were buying this housing up and they were putting uh, uh, public housing back there. And so rather than what took place in the, in the 40s and 50s uh, and the 60s, which is where you got Cash and Avenue, you had uh, segregation where you basically took everybody who was disadvantaged and you put them all into one spot in new housing up on Anderson Avenue or up on Cashin Avenue and, and Buckmaster Circle where the public housing was built, you actually had people going back in to the old neighborhoods, not necessarily the same people, but the same sort of uh, um, a demographic of people were going back in. So you had more of a mix. You had more diversity, you had mix, and I would argue a, a much better uh, social construct. Um, the Grand Concourse, Neil talked about that in his, his thing, absolute fabulous idea. A really good example of someone who had an idea, he had a vision, he also had some money, uh, didn't pay for it all themselves, but had seed money, and he used that money to leverage three levels, two and three levels of government to develop this 
fabulous uh, resource that we have which, uh, in the city. Um, and uh, hats off to Paul Johnson and all the people that uh, gathered around him and, and, and worked with him for that. Um, there's a lot of laneways and neighborhoods in the city, different ways, you know, some good examples of bits and pieces of things that we can look at that are really, really good. Uh, there's ex uh, existing examples of really good, good neighborhoods which we can talk about. And then issues about what to do about the, uh, you know, suburban sprawl because it's really kind of bad. But there's some very good examples from away and, and partially from here as well. So there were a lot of studies that were done uh, over the years. Um, some of them our firm was involved with, um, uh, particularly Philip Pratt from our office. Um, the Heritage Conservation Area study was done by Shepard, Burt, Pratt, and Short, which was Beaton, Shepard, and Philip, who were involved in it uh, back in the 70s. Uh, in the 80s, we were involved with the Retail Corridor study and, and, a, and a, a bunch of other studies as well. Uh, I know Strack Canning, I know Shepard Case did a, an economic uh, strategy uh, that Strat Canning worked with them on that was really quite a, a strong piece, sort of arguing and actually putting a, a financial uh, argument to uh, the heritage value and tourism value of the downtown. And, and everybody knows what that value is when you see the Republic of Doyle and, and you see the, the current uh, uh, advertising that the provincial government has now that it's eye candy and everybody really loves it and people are coming here in droves as a result of it. Um, just an example of some of the things. This is from the Heritage Conservation Area study. They had uh, uh, taking a uh, you know oop, taking a, a sort of a derelict rain, uh, 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 laneway in the downtown. Uh, this again go, talks about this courtyard quadrangle idea and developing it. I know in Halifax, NASCAD had taken a bunch of bunch of houses in the downtown, uh, a bunch of buildings in the commercial area of the downtown of Halifax, and, and developed them into uh, a school, uh, an art school by renovating and making all kinds of connections and roofing over the tops of them uh, and thereby uh, providing uh, really good uh, economic value uh, and more, more tax base. Um, the Courtyard Quadrangle, one of the interesting things about St. John's is that you walk around downtown St. John's and when you're on the streets you say, well, this is pretty bleak, there's no trees, there's not much happening. But one of the things is that there's a tremendous number of trees. If you go up on Signal Hill and look into the down, downtown, you'll see that the place is full of trees. But the trees are actually in behind uh, the rows of houses. So you have a very dense uh, uh, relationship, a very urban relationship to the, to the street, uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a lot of green space. And that's a, that's a model that we know, we know how to use, we've adapted it to our, our own climate, and it's, and it's not a bad solution. Um, one of the uh, arguments that people were putting forward uh, a long time ago is to try to build that same kind of model idea for some of the bigger pr uh, properties that would be in the commercial area downtown. And so the diagram down at the bottom there is, is an idea. Joe Carter, who was an architect, uh, local architect who's now uh, practicing in China, and he was uh, really uh, uh, vocal about some of these things. He was also quite an interesting guy. He was the one who came up with the idea for the Harbor Symphony. Uh, the idea that the architecture of the of St. John's is like an amphitheater, with uh, the stage being the uh, the harbor and the Southside Hills being the backdrop, and himself and Paul Steffler came up with the idea of whatever boats were going to be in town during the Sound Symposium to try to take all of their uh, uh, the notes from all of the whistles and bells, and uh, and and uh, hire someone to do for the festival to do a um, uh, a piece, a uh, music piece by a, uh, an orchestrated uh, uh, using of the ship's horns. Um, some of the other, some other ideas, this is a retail core area uh, downtown. Uh, uh, re this is George Street, so that when George Street was uh, looking at being redeveloped, um, uh, George Street had a little bit done to it and then it went through another massive uh, change. Uh, by hook or by crook, a lot of bars and restaurants were being developed down there, uh, but really, whoops. Everybody turn off their cell phones, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shut that down. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so George Street was being redeveloped, and, and we were hired to look at some of the design opportunities, urban design opportunities that w might be uh, able to be developed down there. We worked with uh, Fred Han or Frederick Han Associates, um, a landscape architectural firm at the time. And um, he's not here anymore, he's moved to the mainland. But, um, and so we were looking at this area. So this is really 
uh, were uh, city, uh, city Hall annexes, uh, basically George Street down to Beck's Cove. Um, this is the Murray premises down in through here. So we were looking at just some of these ideas. One idea of the idea of, of, of uh, St. John's, uh, before it had a marginal wharf that, that goes all the way along, was actually a bunch of finger piers that actually came out from Water Street and, and from the properties that are there. And the idea of bringing back those finger piers, but you're not going to do it, do it around the street level because it doesn't make any sense. But the idea of taking, uh, taking uh, access routes uh, to get you up from Water Street, up a half a level or up a story, and then coming out over uh, Harbor Drive. And if you imagine you could actually take that, that idea on a property by property basis and do it all the way along the waterfront and then connect them with a, uh, with a boardwalk uh, along the front or some interconnectivity. That was the idea we were talking about. So you still maintain all of the um, uh, access to the war from an industrial perspective, from a loading. Um, you still maintain the, the main uh, the road that can come by with the parking and, and the access, uh, but you get maximize some of the development uh, and give people more access to the harbor. Uh, the other idea, uh, which is again akin to the one that was in the um, uh, um, Heritage Conservation Area study is the idea of making connections. One of the, one of the benefits that St. John's has is that being on a, a, steeply, a steep slope, you can actually get access into the second and third floors of the properties on Water Street fairly easily if you only had an opportunity, a way of connecting them uh, and then making some um, um, circulation routes down through the middle part. Uh, the only one I know that really do has done this successfully is now where the rocket is, which used to be Andy Cray's, and you can actually get there from Duckworth Street and go right into the third floor where uh, Janet Son Shane had a, a photo photography studio, and the place can be rented out now and, and is used for, for various venues. But that whole idea of take getting up into the upper floors, because really from the Water Street level alone, from a, from a, a commercial access, you really can only use the main floors. Now this has taken place by and large a lot on George Street. A lot of these upper floors are actually bars now and, and, uh, and nightclubs. Um, so one of, the, one of the things about, about practicing architecture uh, over the years, and particularly now, is, is where we are with the municipal plan and where we were with the municipal plan and how, you know, who, who has control of the process, right? Who gives direction? You know, what policies, you know, who, is, is it really the, the city that's guiding this or is it developers? You know, we have a, uh, the, the municipal plan, um, and I know it's changing, and uh, I'm not a planner, uh, but for years it, it seemed to be a reactive process. There was a prescription out there, and any, any and all offers come and, 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 and see where it can go. So there was more of a reaction planning as opposed to strategic planning. No one's really said, this is where we want, this is what we want in the downtown, or this is where we want in suburbia, or this is where we want to have development. And, and saying, okay, let's put a plan in place, a strategy in place, so that we can actually put things together and, and, and make it to that, to that where we want to go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, th these are just questions. I don't really have answers to all these things, but you know, what's been done to try to improve the process? Um, I know that the new municipal plan, uh, there's been some great feedback from the public uh, with the mayor's uh, 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 round tables and there's another commercial one that's coming up now. Uh, I think, you know, Ken Greenberg was in town uh, uh, working with the city. Uh, again, the city's coming up with a new municipal plan. Now's the opportunity. It's very fortuitous that we have this opportunity with the, with the um, REIC Festival of Architecture being here. Um, and, and so these are, these are some of the things that we're looking at doing and what some of these synergy sessions have been about uh, in cooperation with the Harris Center. The thing we have to try to understand is where, what are the drivers and who, there's, a chicken and, there's always a chicken and egg issue with developers. I know because we, we work with them all the time. Uh, whether you're talking about suburban development and housing development versus commercial development, architects generally don't get involved with any, virtually any kind of housing other than some custom housing or or, or uh, multiple housing types. Uh, so suburbia is a, is a construct that goes on and on and on uh, as a result of just the way the process and the way the market works. And we've sort of said to developers before, look, why, why, why don't you do this? And they say, well, no, 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 the market is telling us that this is what we need. And we're saying, well, yeah, but you're giving the market this stuff and they're going out and seeing this stuff and then so they're picking from that. 
And so there's, the, there's a self-perpetuating uh, thing that's going on. Uh, so there really is, isn't any marketing to t say what can be done and how it might be able to be done. Uh, there's a huge influx of people who are going to be coming into St. John's. There's a new uh, era of people. I guess the internet has made, it, made us all much more intelligent from the point of view of the ability to be able to get more information in front of us. You know, there's so many design shows on TV now, right, and reality shows about design and all that kind of stuff, which would never, unless you picked up a magazine and read it and understood it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. Whereas you sit down to watch TV and you flick through the channels, you know, and you, you know about construction, uh, you know, you've got uh, any, any number of the shows that are on, you, you know about design because people are in front of your face all the time talking about design. So there's a much more uh, intelligent and demanding uh, population, and there's a huge influx of younger people who are coming in who are part of that. that, uh, uh, that. Um, as Neil was talking about and Ken Greenberg was talking about, there's a demand for more fun and quality places uh, uh, to live. Um, from a development perspective, unless there is a financial incentive to make it happen, whether it's from the city's uh, increase in tax base that they can afford to do some of these things, or whether or not it makes sense to a developer to be able to invest in it, uh, it, it's really difficult to make an argument for it. So at the same time we have all these great ideas, they really need to be focused to the point of making, making good economic sense. Uh, Neil talked about it the other day about, about diversity and distinctiveness in St. John's. I mean, every city you go to has, has its own distinctiveness and its own qualities. St. John's has the same thing, and we need to uh, uh, maximize on that some of that diversity Ken Greenberg was talking about some of the same issues in terms of uh, encouraging diversity. Um, and then one of the things that people lose sight of is, um, and I think is really, really important, uh, is sustainability. And sustainability in its broadest sense. You know, we do have a, a global crisis. We do have some issues that we need to try to deal with uh, from an environmental perspective. Um, and, and, uh, but there's also economic sustainability as well. There's a sort of a broad social sustainability. We need to broaden the idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability. Um, and it, it all can work uh, really, 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 really well. Um, just a couple of, uh, just very quickly, um, I think there's opportunities to look outward and look inward. Uh, very quickly, there's, uh, back in the 80s, uh, new urbanism was, was uh, one of the hot trends. Uh, Andre Duaney and Elizabeth platter Zybrook, uh, planner and architect, husband and wife team, uh, started doing developments for developers. Um, and one of the ones that would be most popular was in Seaside in Florida. Um, but they were taking tracts of land and they were designing, they were designing new subdivisions based on uh, uh, last century town making principles. So lining up the streets, walkways, pathways, you can buy a loaf of bread, uh, in a five, you know, always having a shop or some commercial venue within five minutes of every residence, uh, so you don't have to get in your car to go and get a loaf of bread. Uh, you can actually walk uh, around, laying out uh, communities with uh, a lot more uh, uh, central planning. Um, one of the ones you can see here; these are the red dots, having long vistas, public buildings in centrally located areas. Um, what they were doing is they were they were uh, showing examples and samples. They'd go into a community somewhere in the States. They'd be working with the, lo just like we are with people around here from government, all the stakeholders, bring them into the room, doing a one-week charrette. They'd do a week of uh, review before they went in to, in, in to do the charrette, and they'd do samples of all the communities that were in around them. And they came back and drew them up and said, what we're talking about is this. We're talking about that town over there and this town over there, and bringing all the really good examples of those things, but, put it, but laying out in a new way. And I, and I was really inspired by this stuff. And they come up with a zoning code and a way to say, OK, well, look, you can have backlot developments. You can have mother-in-law apartments. You can have all kinds of different types and shapes and sizes of, of properties. We have the same kind of thing in our own community. We just need to look for it. I live in Georgetown. Uh, I live right there. Uh, Georgetown, uh, and I grew up there. My mother was born in that house right there. Um, um, Georgetown, you know, it's got churches and schools all around. It's got some commercial. It's got this courtyard quadrangle idea. There's a tremendous number of trees. 
this is an example of what a suburban dense development could be. We don't need to have to go R1 R zoning everywhere. We can actually look to ourselves and say, what about that? I was doing a proposal for a, 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 a client one time who, who owned the Belvedere, uh, bought the, all the Catholic lands over the Belvedere Cemetery. And I said, what about if you took that idea and then flipped it over Bonaventure Avenue and developed the rest of that land just like this and increased some densities? Anyway, he didn't really like the idea. And he didn't, we didn't, I didn't stay as his architect. But the interesting thing about Georgetown, it's got all the social and all of the uh, valuable aspect to it. It's got uh, pathways and laneways that, that come in through. This is Davies Field, uh, which is in the middle of one of the blocks. Uh, it's got a laneway. You can walk right through it and come in from one street out the other. It's got back laneways, so the people that are on uh, Hayward Avenue and Burns Road, which are wall-to-wall -wall houses, actually have a laneway in behind them, to, so they've got parking off the street, uh, sheds and various things in the background. It's got the Georgetown Pub. I haven't been in Georgetown Pub in a long while, but I, I went in there the, uh, uh, about three weeks ago on a Tuesday night. Half a dozen people in there playing traditional music, learning songs off each other. It was a real community pub. You got the uh, uh, Stephen Lewis and the Georgetown Bakery uh, that, that they developed, which is a, a fabulous economic going concern. And this is and it's in walking distance, right? There's also uh, Graf and Kampf's, uh, you know, a couple in the neighborhood that you can go. You know, you're fairly close to, to everywhere. Uh, uh, so it's a very, very, we don't have to go very far to look. Um, now I'm going to move it into some of, some of the reasons why uh, we wanted to do all this because of the REIT Festival. I'm the co-chair of the, of the festival with Kerry Goss from our office. And when we were approached about a year and a half ago to host the festival, we thought, well, you know, what can we do here? Yeah, we can do it. We can, we, we can, we can host it. But we wanted to try to take advantage of all of the brain power that, that was going to be coming in. Uh, and so when, when Talbot and, uh, and, uh, and the School of Architecture in Halifax said, yeah, we'd be interested, we'd, we could probably bring some students in, it would be a really cool idea, I thought, well, what a fabulous idea that would be. Um, Rob got a hold of us through, through uh, Elizabeth Lawrence at the city and said this would be a great idea. So there's, a, there, there's also a brand new era of vocalism. People are a lot more uh, outspoken. There's a tremendous uh, number of people who are getting involved in the municipal plan process coming out to the, uh, uh, the mayor's uh, things. There's new blood in town. There's younger architects, younger people who are interested in, in getting involved. Um, like I say, the municipal player of the round table and there's new approaches to partnerships, which this event here is one of those with the Newfoundland Association of Architects, the Harris Center, Department of Geography, City of St. John's. Uh, we've, we've got the Board of Trade and a whole bunch of other stakeholders that, that, that have supported us. ACOA liked the idea from an economic perspective and, gave, and have given us some money for, for the project. Uh, so what would be the three things that you'd want to change or uh, encourage? I think Creating a collective vision, I don't know how, exactly how we do this, but this is part of the process of doing that. Uh, being, uh, you know, um, um, someone asked a question of Ken Greenberg the other day. He said, you really need to be proactive. Once, 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 some, once a developer's hired an architect, they've already got their mind made up and the clock is ticking, the meter's running. Uh, you really need to get a process in place where uh, there's more of this kind of dialogue, more of this kind of charrettes things. And again, it needs, it needs to be flexibility, adaptability, adaptability and innovation. Um, the hypothetical architect. One of the things we wanted to do, and as part of the festival, is we have um, uh, nine architecture students and a professor from the School of Architecture. And They've been here for about 10 days, and we've given them three sites. This is very challenging for, for students to be doing this. We've given them three sites, uh, Prescott and Water, uh, the Old Grace Hospital site, and Rope Walk Lane across from Sobeys. And we've said, we want you to look at this fr with fresh eyes, uh, come up with any ideas, open conversations and discussions, and we want you to present these. So on Wednesday of this week, and everybody's invited to come, on Wednesday of this week, the students uh, are going to be presenting. We'll have a little introduction, and then there's going to be three sessions where the students will present their ideas on these three sites, and then at the end of the day, there's going to be a panel discussion. So it's going to be a day-long event. 
takes place at the Delta on Wednesday. So everybody's welcome to come down. But the idea here is there's no developer. We're, we're, we're just coming up with ideas. It's, a, it's an idea, a free idea, and a free ideas and exchange of ideas just for the talk about the ideas themselves. So that without any preconceived notions of what the land costs or how it might be developed or what the zoning may be, but really going and looking at the neighborhood and looking at all the issues, we've asked, asked the students to, to look at that. So uh, we're really excited uh, with what's going to be coming out of it, uh, and we encourage you to come. And that's it. Thank you. Right.